Okay. Wow. It's so good to be here. <laughs> good to see all of your smiling faces. This message comes kind of by request of Susan. One of the first times I talked to her, I talked about Midnight in the Bible, and she said she wanted to hear more about this midnight theme in Scripture. And so midnight is very intimate in the Scriptures. It is sown throughout the entire Bible, actually. It is also very intimate to our history as Adventists, and understanding it both Christologically in the Gospel, as well as historically and prophetically in our faith, gives us a unique identity. And understanding that more fully gives us the hope and the courage and the confidence we need such that we cannot be shaken or moved in a time of trouble. And so today we're going to assess something about the midnight cry in our history. And so I want to begin by asking a question. How many people were born Seventh-day Adventist? I just want to take some raw data. Anybody in the audience? We have one person, two, three, four. It, no one, how many people were converted to Adventism at some point in your life? Okay. How many people was born in a Christian home? Any kind of Christian home? Christian, Jewish, or Catholic? How many people were born in a home where you didn't go to church as a kid? Okay, all right. We have a unique spread. So, <clears throat> either way, all roads <laughs> leads to where you're sitting here today, in which case you're Adventist now and you need to know this truth, correct? So, the first question I'm going to ask you is, what was the first harvest of the year in Jerusalem? Does anybody know? What was the first plant that was harvested in Jerusalem on the beginning of their calendar year? Wheat? Wheat? This is it. Okay. You've got wheat, barley, rye. You have the almond. All of these grew in Jerusalem. Manna. <laughs> so let, let's let's figure this out here, because this is going to be important, and I am when you're going to see why. Okay. So in Exodus chapter nine, verses twenty-six to twenty-eight, we we're going to take place here in the uh, Egypt. Okay. And this is when the plagues were falling. It says, "Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were." Does this have a laser pointer? Oh, it does. Uh, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time, the Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. So this was the middle of the plagues. He wouldn't let the children of Israel go. And so God's sending the plagues, and this time hail is falling. Now notice, where is the one place hail did not fall? Only in the land of Goshen. And so I will tell you right now, there is a, we have to be in the land of Goshen during the seven last plagues. That's the place where the, God's people will be kept from the seven last plagues, is the spiritual land of Goshen. And Goshen was outside of the city-state of Egypt. So it kind of represents the country where God's people are supposed to live where the plagues didn't fall. So in Exodus, so this 28, down to verse 31, it says, Notice the observation of what was destroyed when the hail fell on the earth. And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was bold, or had come to seed. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were what? Not grown up. So we have two crops, the flax and the barley were destroyed, but the wheat and the rye were not destroyed because what? They weren't grown, they weren't, in, they weren't above ground, correct? So the spring harvest, so this is from the Barnes Bible Commentary, the flax was bold, i.e. blossomed or potted. This marks the time of the year. In the north of Egypt, the barley grows into a stalk, and flax blossoms about the middle of what? February. 
So what time of year was the plagues falling? February. Or at the latest, early in March. So remember, when they were in Egypt, under bondage, what were they trying to do? They were trying to get out of bondage so God could take them where? To the promised land, correct? And what land was the promised land? Present day, modern day, Jerusalem, Israel, correct? So this is, the, Pharaoh's getting ready to let them go. It's the month of February. The, there was two things. The, the flax had blossomed or potted, and what was the barley? It was above ground. It was a stalk. Because it says the barley was in the ear. Okay? The barley was in the ear. <coughs> so we know the time of year is about February. But they were both, uh, they didn't, weren't ready for harvest until the end of March, and they were gathered by early April. Okay? This is our time. Remember, God let them go, and if they did not doubt God, they were supposed to go directly into Jerusalem, which was a seven days journey. How many days did it take the children of Israel to get to Jerusalem? Forty years. It was a seven days journey, and it took them 40 years because of unbelief. They did not enter in because of unbelief. Do you know when we were given the three angels' message, God could have come right away if we had believed the message, but we did not enter in because of unbelief. Our people, we did not believe. <clears throat> so there's a lot of parallels here. So we see these things are revolving around a time on a calendar. So now the barley was in the ear, and the Bible defines, can you pick something that's in the ear? If it's in the ear, is it ripe for harvest? It says the barley was in its ear. Does that mean it's ripe? And so what does the Bible say? Jesus says in Mark chapter 4, verses 28 and 29, for the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the what? The full corn in the ear. So when do you harvest the fruit? When it's the full corn. So it says, but when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put forth the sickle because the harvest is come. So when do you do the harvest? At the ear or at the full corn in the ear? Full the full corn. So in February, when the flax was potting and the barley was in the ear, was the barley ready for harvest? No. Okay, so the question is, we're still figuring out the time of year. The barley or the ear is not yet ready to be harvested. We know when it's in the ear, it's not ready to put in the sickle. The month of the barley harvest designated the first month of the Jewish calendar. This is important for understanding the midnight cry in the Bible, okay? If you've never, this is Adventist history, what we're going to start learning here. So the barley harvest in Leviticus 23 was used to say on the first month, when the barley turned ripe, that's how they determined the first month of the Jewish year, okay? The barley was the first harvest because they had to use it in what was called a wave sheaf offering, which is one of the seven holy days. We have a tax cycle that is based on our agricultural cycle. Do you know that? You know why you pay taxes by April 15th? Because when we founded this country in 1776, we had an agricultural economy. And so you had to be taxed based off of how much you grew. And so you didn't pay taxes until the barley harvest came in for the year. Did you know that? Now you know why you pay taxes on April 15th. <laughs> because the they, government wants to see how much money you made. It's based off of an agricultural year, based off of the Bible, in case you didn't know. So the wheat and the rye matured in the fall. So the wheat and the rye were fall crops. After the latter rain, at the end of the agricultural year, the plague comes in in the spring. The plagues of Egypt came in the spring around January, starting in January to February. They were let go, and they were supposed to get to Jerusalem by the end of March, where the barley would be ripe and they would be able to make an offering with Passover. But it took them 40 years later, but I digress. So here, these two crops were not grown up out of the soil. Remember, Jesus compares the ch 
condition of his church with the wheat and the tares or the weeds, which were the wicked. And so the wheat germinates when? At the fall or at the end of the year, which represents the end of the world or the second coming. So you have early, early harvest and you have late harvest, okay? Barley came in the spring, wheat came in the fall. To God, it is the seventh month. So we're looking at October. This is the fall. Octobre or tubre is Latin for eight, and it's actually a pagan name. Octavius, the Roman centurion, uh, or the Roman emperor, named October after himself. It was the, represents eight, and the Rome used the language of Latin, and so it means eight. But to God, if April was the first month, you go April, May, June, July, August, September, October, Technically, October is the seventh month because you base it off of the barley harvest. When the barley harvest came in April, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, it was the seventh month of the Jewish year. Do you understand? Everybody with me? You know, do I need to go over it again? How did, they, how did they name, how did they begin the new year? Based off of what harvest? The barley harvest. The Shavuot. From the first month, they would count seven months to get to what we call October, which was the month of the Day of Atonement, right? It was the seventh month ceremony was in the Day of Atonement, correct? So understanding how they got to the seventh month for the Day of Atonement, you have to understand it because you can't just Google it because it'll give you a wrong time. You have to go off of the barley harvest. This is what the Adventist pioneers did. So the barley was the first crop of, in Jerusalem for the harvest in the new year. Uh, and it, it ripened in the spring, and it, it was harvested the end of March, early April for the first month. <clears throat> Here it says the barley was it, had, uh, it was in the ear, it was still green. And what would happen is when the rainstorms would come in the early, the early months, the rain and the hail, the hail would beat on the green leaves and it would bend, but it wouldn't break and it would come back up. But when it would turn brown, it had to be harvested before the, the thunderstorms, otherwise it would break. So it had to be harvested. Once it turned this color, they had about 14 days to harvest before the next storms would come in in Jerusalem. And from the day of the harvest, it would start the first day of the first month. So how did they know? The, bar the harvest was a sign as to when the new year would reset. Once the stem of the barley turned brown, it took, they had to look to the heavens. And so here's how you combine the stars and the moon with the harvest cycle. Once it turned brown, they had to look to the heavens and they had to watch for the new moon, which occurred within 14 days of the barley harvest. After, the day after that particular new moon was the first of Nisan. The Bible says Nisan is the first month, the first day of the first month. So 14 days from the new moon was to be what special ceremony? Passover. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 23, Passover was the 14th day of the first month and they had to determine Passover from the time the barley harvest happened. They looked for the first new moon, and 14 days later would be Passover. Got it? You think so? Once the harvest turned brown, you look for the new moon. The day after is the first day of the first month. The Bible says 14 days later you were to have Passover. Passover was the 14th. It says the Sabbath after Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the day after the Sabbath was the wave sheaf offering, where you had to go out and take the barley harvest. You had to take it before the priest and wave it in the sanctuary, and it was an offering of first fruits. It was the very first harvest that came from the land that was germinated or cultivated. And the first fruits represented the first offering that would go before God in the sanctuary for the land. You got it? Because this is just, we're, we're not even to midnight yet. This is just the beginning of the year. So the new moons, you see the new moon? It's the absence of a moon. 
Full moon is over here. You go waxing and waning, right? Waning gibbous, quarter, waning crescent, new moon, waxing crescent, first quarter, waxing gibbous. So this is growing, this is shrinking, okay? This is your lunar cycle. So on the new moon, the day after the new moon was the first day of the first month. So the rod would stiffen. The children of Israel were to taught to gather in the harvest. This barley harvest would become the wave sheaf offering in the Feast of First Fruits. The ceremony of the wave sheaf, of the first sheaf of barley to be accepted by God, the ceremony we read about in Leviticus 23. All seven feast days, all seven ceremonies are mentioned in Leviticus 23 in order with what you were supposed to do, the day they occurred on, and the order of events. All seven feast days have type and anti-type parallels to the end of the world. All of these feast days represent something at the end of time, or, or beginning with Christ and dying on the cross because he was the anti-type of the Passover lamb. Correct? The wave sheaf offering when Christ was in the tomb, uh, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, represented his body, and then the wave sheaf offering, remember at his resurrection, what unique thing happened when Christ resurrected? What does the Bible say happened? There was a resurrection from the dead. The Bible records, it says, the earth was, there was a mighty earthquake, the tombs were opened, and people came forth out of the grave and did what? Testified of him, and it says they went to heaven with him. The, and so they had to be resurrected and they were presented to God the Father as the first fruits of the resurrection, the church of the firstborn that Paul writes about in Colossians. So these are all things in Adventism we need to understand. So how does this relate to Adventist history? So in the Bible, chapter, Matthew chapter 25, we read a probably the most well-known theme of midnight in all of Scripture, and that's Matthew chapter 25, what we come to know as the parable of the bridegroom and the ten virgins. Is that correct? The word midnight occurs in Scripture 14 times. This is only one occurrence. And so all occurrences of midnight actually have an end-time parallel to Adventism, and it'd be well for each one of you to go and study those. Now here, uh, in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 6 to 10, it says, And at midnight there was a what? A cry made. Behold the what? Bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So when the cry is made, what, is, re what response is elicited from the congregation? Get up off your butt, go out and do what? Meet him. You understand? It requires a call to action. When you hear this cry, you can't sit there anymore. You are called to action. Uh-oh, it broke. I'm hitting reconnect. It's not doing anything. There it is. So it says, Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go out, go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with the bridegroom to the marriage, and the door was shut. So while the foolish was out buying oil from an alternative oil source, because Christ is no longer in the sanctuary providing oil, they go out into darkness, and only the devil is there to sell oil. And so they buy a counterfeit oil. While they're out buying counterfeit oil, Christ comes, and the righteous go in with the bridegroom. Does that make sense? So that's, that's in time parallel. But there's, a, there's an Adventist history parallel to this message when this began, the true midnight cry. So, okay, now i got to click my screen. There we go. So let me ask you a question. What came first, midnight or the midnight cry? Midnight? You going to hold to your answer? I think so. You're going to hold to it? How many of you, have you, how many uses alarms to get up in the morning? You ever set an alarm? So what comes, you say, okay, I'm going to set the alarm for 7 a.m. for work. What happens first? Does the alarm sound? Or does 7 a.m. occur? 7 a.m. occurs. 7 a.m. occurs, then what? The alarm goes off, correct? 
So what happens first? The time or the, the alarm? The time. Okay, so there's a gospel order, a chronology of events. So who had to get up and leave in order to enter the marriage? The virgins were called out. Could they have entered the marriage while staying, or they were with the foolish virgins? The answer is no. Birds of a feather flock together, right? So if you stay with unbelievers, guess what camp you're going to be lumped with? Unbelievers. So when the time comes, there is going to be a what? A separation, a shaking, is that correct? All right, now, now we're going to get into the detail. In case you didn't think that was detailed enough. So in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah was a major prophet in the Old Testament. In chapter 55, he gives some interesting com uh, notes here. He says, as the rain and the snow come down from what? Heaven. And do not return to it without what? watering the earth. What are we talking about with the barley harvest? It had to be cultivated. Water had to come down from heaven to cause the barley to mature. And what does the water do to the plant? It makes it bud and flourish. It produces a harvest. So that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so it is what? My word. Whose word? God's word. So what does God's word do? It waters the earth, and what does it do? It produces a, a bud and flourishing. So the word that goes out of my mouth, says the Lord, it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So what is likened to a rain falling on the earth? The what? The word of God being preached. Is that right? Because what... What does he liken the rain to? His word that goes out of his mouth. What's the word that goes out of the mouth of God? The Bible, right? Correct? John 1.1, 1, 1, the word was made flesh. Job 37, Job gets in on the action and Job says, he says to the snow, fall on the earth and to the rain shower, be a mighty Downpour. So snow and rain are always linked together as a form of precipitation that brings about a harvest on the earth. Snow, water represent the word of God, a mighty downpour on the earth. Deuteronomy says, what is the rain like? Let my doctrine. So when the rain is falling on the earth, what is it actually? The word of God, it says, the word comes out of my mouth and the word of God is his doctrine, right? So what the Bible says, Isaiah 55, 11, Job 37, 5, and Deuteronomy 32, 2, all testify of the same. So snow, which is the same as the waters of the earth, the word of God is like being preached, which represents a mighty downpour like rain, and the Bible says it is the what? the doctrine of God. Does that make sense? So guess what happened in 1844? There was a mighty snowstorm. <laughs> You're going to see this. So who, who all knows of Samuel Sheffield Snow? Anybody know who Snow is? Anybody? Has anybody ever heard of Samuel Snow? Nobody? You were born Adventist. You didn't know? <laughs> Without Samuel Snow, the Adventist church wouldn't exist. Okay, he, he is just as integral as William Miller, if not more. In the summer of 1843, Elder Snow, along with William Miller and his associates, predicted Christ's return on April 19, 1844. Now, why, where did they come up with April 19th? Anybody know? Something about a harvest, right? That's exactly right. They understood what I just taught you about the barley harvest. So why April 19th? April 19th was the first day of the first month of the Jewish year. 
based on the barley harvest and the new moon. That they went, it, they were alive then. They literally had records. The almanac in Jerusalem says the barley harvest happened here. The new moon was April 18th, the very next day, the first day of the first month of the new year. So they said, oh, Christ has to come. Remember, is the, what prophecy are they basing this off of? What prophecy? The 2300-day prophecy, right? So they all knew in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, there was a prophecy. At the end of the 2300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. They thought that sanctuary cleansing meant Christ was going to return to the earth. So they said they knew the time that Artaxerxes would give a decree in Ezra chapter 7 to go forth and rebuild the sanctuary in the year 457 B.C. The Bible says in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 1, in the seventh year of the reign of King Artaxerxes. You go to Google, it says the reign of King Artaxerxes began in 463 B.C. No, 460. 464. 464 B.C. was the reign of Artaxerxes. You count down seven years, it says in the seventh year of his reign, he made a decree for them to rebuild Jerusalem. You come, 467 minus, 464 minus 7 gives you 457 B.C. So they said this is when it begins. They counted for 2,300 years, they come to 1844. They have to ask, well, when? Well, they said, well, let's first begin. Maybe he's going to come on the first day of the first month. And so they say it's going to be April 19th. You got it? If you were then, if you were alive in 1844, you'd probably think he was right because his logic is very sound. Got it? They used the barley harvest. Now, Christ did not return on April 19th, 1844. So many were disappointed but Samuel Snow turned to the scriptures and he preached that Christ had not come because they had not come out of Babylon on the Sabbath, on that Sabbath. So Samuel Snow was the snow that watered the earth with the preaching of the second angel's message. And so from April 19th, they began preaching come out of Babylon because they were still in all these other churches which were divided on doctrine. They were not united on what they believed. And so they had to come out of Babylon. And that's when that calling out began. This led to a tarrying time. In the spring of 1844, this brought what is known as the first disappointment. But they weren't, uh, they didn't give up. They started re-examining and they looked at the 2300-day prophecy and they realized there was another prophetic statement in the Bible. And it says in Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, And the Lord answered unto me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, do what? Wait. So it wasn't at the beginning of the year. It was going to be at the end. You had to tarry. You had to wait for the event to take place because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So when they saw this, they went back to re-examine the time. This tarrying time led to a midnight. In harmony with the language of Habakkuk, they were now in the tarrying time. When we look at the parable of the ten virgins, what happened to all of the virgins? In the middle of the story, they got tired and did what? Went to sleep because there was a tarrying before the bridegroom came. Is that correct? We know that a day in Bible prophecy equals what? A, each day for a, a year. What Bible verse says that? Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6 and Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34. You need to have those memorized. Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6 and Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34. That's your proof text that it says each day is for a year in the Bible. No, Peter, 1 Peter chapter uh, 3 and verse 12 says each day is with the Lord for a thousand years. And he's a reference to the, that's chapter, verse 3 and 8 and verse 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. So he's refer, it's a reference to salvation. So a 24-hour day in prophecy stands for a year. Thus, the, here at night, there is a half, 
period, right? So 12 hours of the day is what? The sun is up. You're in the light. 12 hours of the day at sundown, it is nighttime, correct? So out of a whole year of 12 months, half of the year is day, the other half is night, right? You can divide that year in half. And so we're going to see a spiritual midnight take place during the year 1844. Do you understand? So at night, night began on April 19th. The night lasted from April 19th to October 22nd. There is a six-month interval or half of the year which represented that dark period in the earth. Does that make sense? When they were trying to figure out the truth concerning the midnight cry. So they were in this period of darkness now and he's telling them to come out of Babylon because they've missed the truth. There's a message here and they've missed it. And who's preaching the message? What's his name? Snow. snow. The Bible says snow fell as doctrine to the ground that brought forth a harvest. So this midnight interval divides this six-month period. So let's say you have night from here to here, right? This is ha there's the 12-hour day or the whole year, correct? Here you have January, February, March, April. You get, you get to midnight or you get the half dark of the night. And so here, what you have, if midnight is the top of the hour, you have six months representing the nighttime of Earth's history. Twelve midnight is three months. You divide that six-month period into three months, right? So you get three more increments. So that puts the midnight itself sometime in the middle of that summer. If it began on April 19th, because that was their disappointment, so they entered the night. Right? Time went by. They started preaching the message. Midnight gets closer. It's now the middle of summer in 1844. There's a tarrying time. Everybody's going to sleep and they're waiting for a message. This middle period or midnight would sometime be in 1844 during the summer months. They re-examined the prophecies and they were, wait they were considering when Christ would come. Again, Samuel Snow began watering the earth. So what happened? So they had camp meeting. On July 21st, 1844, this is exactly three months from April 19th. Does anybody know what happened on July 21st, 1844? Does anybody, have any, has anybody ever heard of the Boston Tabernacle camp meeting? It was one of the largest Millerite camp meetings in 1844. Nobody ever heard that? It's in the book uh, Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. He writes about it. It's, Mrs. White references it in her writings, in the book Early Writings. It's an extremely important date. On July 21st, Samuel Snow gives a message at the Boston Tabernacle. So this is kind of a picture of it. The, the grand the Miller Tabernacle in Boston, Mar uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And Samuel Snow makes the announcement for the first time in Adventist history, Christ is going to return on October 22, 1844. Midnight strikes. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. This time was the true midnight in 1844, exactly three hours past April 19th, and three hours later would be October 22nd, 1844. Do you see that? Everybody understand midnight here, the exact time? This is exactly 12 o'clock midnight on the year 1844. It's the exact dead of night of the year. Everybody understand? However, no one accepted his message that Christ would return on October 22nd. All of, the full, all of the virgins were asleep. So something has to come and wake them up. What comes first, midnight or the midnight cry? Midnight, so this is midnight. Something has to follow this. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and it wakes what? Half of them wake up. It says, the, well, they all wake up. 
and the ones with oil enter in. Ellen White says, During the summer camp meeting season of 1844, certain Millerite preachers began to proclaim what they declared was the true midnight cry. They averred that the movement was in the tarrying time, that the 2300 days ended on October 22, 1844, and that the cry which was to go forth at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, was due to be heard at the very time, the summer of 1844. All right, we're entering the midnight cry. Everybody take a deep breath. Here we go. <laughs> okay. The midnight cry happened on August 14th and 15th, 1844. This is what the Bible would call the first day of the fifth month. Does anybody know what happened on the first day of the fifth month in Jewish history? So th this is, these are my abbreviations here, okay? 1D5M, first day, fifth month. So when you see that, because when I, when I first day, first month, first day, fifth month, seventh day, you know, seventh month, tenth day for Day of Atonement, you get your, I'm labeling these so you can keep track, okay? <clears throat> so Samuel Snow was preaching again. This time it was the midnight cry message. And on August 14th and 15th, everyone actually understood it. So what was taking place here? Ellen White says here, the people who received the message became living witnesses. This was at the Exeter camp meeting. You can go and you can Google the Boston Tabernacle camp meeting and you can Google the Exeter camp meeting. It'll tell you when and where they occurred and at what time. Here the midnight cry was received and understood, a different experience from the preaching in Boston on July 21st, 1844. Isn't that when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month? Yes. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. Oh yeah, so we're going to get to that. Oh. <laughs> he knows. Frank is on to something. Here. Ezra chapter 7 verses 9 to 10 gives us two puzzle pieces to the clue. I hope you all are paying attention. Remember, under the third decree, the first decree of Jerusalem began when? It was in Ezra chapter 1. The second decree of Jerusalem was in Ezra chapter 2. The third decree for them to rebuild Jerusalem and to restore the walls was the beginning of Ezra chapter 7. Ezra was the prophet and at this time Ezra himself says I'm going to go up with them because they're slacking. They're taking too long and so I'm going to go myself. It says for upon the first day of the first month, what? The first day of what? The first month. So day, month one, day one. April 19th, 1844 began Ezra to go up from Babylon. What began preaching? What message did Samuel Snow begin preaching on the first day of the first month? Leave Babylon. Ezra leaves Babylon on the first day of the first month. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem. Let's count. April, May, June, July, August. What month? August is the fifth month. When did he preach the Exeter camp meeting? August. It says on the first day of the fifth month. If you go back to the Jewish calendar and look, August 14th is the first day of the fifth month on the Jewish calendar. April 19th is the first day of the first month in 1844 on the Jewish calendar. You got it? It was a prophetic movement. When he came to Jerusalem, you notice it took him five months to figure it out? It took him five months to receive the midnight cry. According to the good hand of God upon him, who was leading Ezra? The hand of God. Do you see that? For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. And to do what? To teach in Israel statutes and judgments. You know what the message in 1844 was? To teach, the, to restore the law of God and the, that the judgment of God was going to begin. 
fear God and give glory to Him. First angel's message. So here's what we got. On the first day of the first month, Ezra left from Babylon to go toward Jerusalem. On April 19, 1844, snow preached to come out of Babylon, first day of the first month. On the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem to teach in Jeru Israel statutes and judgments, first day, fifth month. On August 15, 1844, the first day of the fifth month, snow preached to Israel the judgments of God and to prepare their hearts for the coming of Christ on October 22, 1844 at the Exeter camp meeting. This was the midnight cry. On the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. He came to Jerusalem, which is to say, the sanctuary was restored when he came to Jerusalem under the third decree, which took how many years? From the third decree, it took him 46 years to rebuild the sanctuary. This is where the sanctuary began being rebuilt in 1844. For the first time, the Millerites understood that God had a sanctuary and it, it concluded doctrines the rain that fell to the earth, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 2, it says, My word is as doctrine that falls to the earth. The doctrine held in the sanctuary, in the most holy place, the Sabbath, the law of God, the health message, righteousness by faith, those messages had to be restored in God's true church. And it took them 46 years from the going forth of this message to understand it. You add 46 to 1844, you get the year 1890. The last component of the sanctuary began to be rebuilt in the year 1888 when they understood the message of Christ our righteousness from E.J. Wagner and A.T. E. Jones. Ellen White says God gave a more precious message to his people through his elders A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. They brought the message of Christ our righteousness. This is the final part of the third angel which is Christ in you the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. So this period parallels how long it took them to rebuild Jerusalem. We know that in the book of Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25, know therefore and understand. God always, signif God always places an emphasis on what? Understanding. Do you know Jesus never says read the Bible? He says understand it. He says study to show yourself approved. He says blessed are they who understand. Stand. He says, here is wisdom, him that has understanding, Isaiah 28, verse 9. You have to understand. You can't just surface read. He says, so when the sanctuary was going to be rebuilt, when the Messiah the Prince should come, after the, this is the 40, the 70 weeks prophecy, it says the sanctuary would rebuilt in troublous times. So Daniel chapter 9 is directly connected to Ezra chapter 7, where it says it would take him 46 years to rebuild the sanctuary in troublous times. So it, so it was, it took them a lot of hardship during those 46 years to rebuild the sanctuary. So the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. This is Great Controversy 393. Ellen White says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto the ten virgins. Here is brought to view the church living in the what? the last days. The same that is pointed out in the close of Matthew chapter 24. In this parable their experience is illustrated by the events of a what? Eastern marriage. Another theme in scripture is the Eastern marriage. Christ references marriage more than any other kind of parable while he was on the earth. The book of Revelation is a story about an Eastern marriage. The first church that she fell from her first love. She commits adultery. And she removes her candlestick from the windowsill. This is symbol, symbolic language of an Eastern marriage. So the next time I'll speak, I'll speak about the Eastern marriage in the Bible. Review and Herald, August 19, 1890. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five were foolish. This parable what? Has been. Is that future or past tense? Past tense, what year is she writing this? 1890. So when she says has been, what does that mean? It already happened. So what already happened? The parable of what? The ten virgins, the midnight cry. So when she says it already happened, what was she referring to? The midnight cry, right? 
When did the midnight cry occur? 1844. We just learned that. What, what, what time did the, what was the day the midnight cry occurred? August 14 and 15th, 1844. Exeter camp meeting. Samuel Snow preaches the coming of Christ and they received it. It says, has been and what? Will be perfectly fulfilled to the very letter. So what does that mean? We're going to repeat this history again. There's another midnight in our future. Only this time the midnight will be when Christ leaves the sanctuary. Because what happens when they go to buy oil? There's no more oil. So this she says, it has been and will be fulfilled perfectly to the very letter. For it has a what? Special application to what? This time. And like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be what? Present truth till what? The close of time. Do you see why this is present truth? In the summer of 1844, 50,000 people withdrew from the churches. Was Samuel Snow effective in preaching the second angel's message come out of Babylon? How many people left the fallen churches? 50,000 people left. Great controversy, 376. Near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The near the close of the second angel. So what time is, in earth is this? What time period? The second angel's message began sounding on what? April 19th, 1844. It came to a close at the end toward October 22nd. So at toward... The October 22nd, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God, these 50,000 people. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun, and I heard voices of angels crying, and the angels represented these ministers and men of God who were preaching the message. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. This was the midnight cry, which was to give what? Power to the second angel's message. The midnight cry for us will give us power and under the fourth angel's message, the loud cry. We have the midnight cry in history. We're getting ready to enter into the loud cry at the closing scenes of the final atonement in the sanctuary. Ellen White, Early Writings, 238. A mighty work was accomplished by the what? Midnight cry. The message was heart-searching, leading the believers to seek a living experience for themselves. They knew that they could not lean upon one another. Angels were watching with the deepest interest the what? The effect of the message. It brings about an effect in the people. And they were elevating those who received it and drawing them from earthly things to obtain large supplies from salvation's fountain. So they were relying more and more upon God. God's people were then accepted of him. Jesus looked upon them with pleasure for his what? image was reflected in them. That's the effect of the message. They were as close to perfection as humanly possible coming into 1844, October 22nd. That's how powerful the message was. Here it says the door was shut after the end. Early writings, 261. But many who profess to love Jesus and who shed tears as they read the story of the cross derided the good news of his coming. Instead of receiving the message with gladness, they declared it to be a delusion. They hated those who loved his appearing and shut them out of the churches. So these are the church leaders, the church leadership. Those who rejected the first message of the, this is the first angel's message, could not be benefited by the second. Neither were they benefited by the what? The midnight cry. So truth is progressive. If you're rejecting truth you have now, you're not going to accept truth later because you're missing the platform to stand on. So they rejected the midnight cry, which was what? To prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place. So they could not enter into the most holy place because they rejected the light of the midnight cry and the second angel's message and the first angel's message. And by rejecting the two former messages, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel, which shows the way into the most holy place. So in summary, this is the order of events. 
first angel's message began sounding on September 8, in September 1833 to March 1844, and this was the work of William Miller. And I, I, there's a whole prophecy revolving around this in the Bible, if you don't know it. It deals with uh, the Feast of Trumpets. On, on the second angel's message began on our, April 1844 to October 1844. This was the work that God used Samuel Snow. Midnight occurred on what? July 21st, 1844 at the Boston Tabernacle Choir. Samuel Snow preached and they rejected the message at midnight. They were asleep. The midnight cry came on August 15th on the what? The first day of the fifth month. This was Exeter camp meeting. Samuel Snow preached. 50,000 people heard and accepted the message and came out of Babylon. They received the message. October 22nd, Christ did not come and there was a great disappointment. They later realized through the work of Joseph Bates and O.R.L. Crozer. Crozer had the, had the vision in the field. He was walking through the field while he was praying and God opened the heavens before him and he saw the scene of Christ in the most holy place of the sanctuary. And they realized that when it says the sanctuary would be cleansed, it wasn't Christ coming to the earth. It was Christ entering into the most holy place where he would begin cleansing the sanctuary from the defilement of sin for 6,000 years. The sin that had defiled the sanctuary for 6,000 years. I only got a couple more slides. So it says... Great Controversy 310, it was needful that men should be awakened to their danger, that they should be roused to prepare for the solemn events connected with the what? Close of probation. And it shall come to pass at that time that I, God the Father, will what? Search? Interesting. What does it mean when God the Father is going to search Jerusalem with candles? Isn't that interesting language? And do what? Punish the men that are settled on their dregs of wine. That's, that's Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 12. You want God to punish you if he finds you settling on a dreg of wine? Are you, are you, in, are you sedated on wine right now? No. Are you lethargic? No. We shouldn't be. Why does he search with candles? Because it will be midnight when the groom returns. When Christ finishes his work in the sanctuary, it will be midnight in earth's history. The plagues were falling upon the inhabitants of the earth. Some were denouncing God and cursing him. Others rushed to the people of God and begged to be taught how they might escape the judgments. The, wise, the foolish said to the wise, give us your oil so we can get out, escape the judgment. But the saints had nothing for them. They said, we cannot give to you it's not ours to give. The last tear for sinners had been what? Shed. The last agonizing prayer offered. She said her quote earlier. What was your quote about prayer? They cannot escape our they cannot do any they can't stop us from praying for them. The enemy can wall us in, he can roof us in and he can handcuff us, but he can't roof us in from God, can he? But at this time in earth's history, at midnight, the last agonizing prayer has been offered. And this is a reference to Christ. Christ is no longer your intercessor. He's gone. He's on, his, he's on a cloud headed toward the earth, and he's wearing the robes of judgment. The last burden borne, the last warning had been given. The sweet voice of mercy was no more there to invite them. When the saints in all heaven were interested in their salvation, they had no interest for themselves. Life and death had been set before them. Early Writings 281. Many desire life, but made no effort to obtain it. They did not choose life, and now there was no atoning blood to cleanse the guilty, no compassionate Savior to plead for them and cry, spare, spare the sinner a little longer. This is what Christ is doing today. Today is the day of salvation. All heaven had united with Jesus, and they had heard the fearful words, it is done, it is finished. And this is a quote from the book of Revelation when he ends the work in Revelation chapter 19. The plan of salvation had been accomplished, but few had chosen to accept it. And as mercy's sweet voice died away, fear and horror seized the wicked. With terrible distinctness, they heard the words, too late, too late. 
the sixth plague, it says, darkness falls over the throne of the beast, and all the followers of the beast system were crushed by the inevitable darkness they felt because Christ was no longer interceding for them. I think that's it. Pretty sure that's my last slide. So you don't want to hear the words too late. That is the midnight cry of Seventh-day Adventism. Ezra chapter 7 verse 9 is your key text. Ezra leaves Babylon on the first day of the first month and he arrives at Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month to prepare to finish the work of rebuilding the sanctuary. Samuel Snow studied this prophecy and realized they were living the fulfillment of the prophecy. It was fulfilled to the very day. This is our Adventist history, and Ellen White says it has been fulfilled and it will be fulfilled to the very letter. And she says it has been present truth and it will be present truth to the close of probation. You should keep this message before you and you should think deeply about it. And you shouldn't let it escape your mind. And if you have more questions, you can come ask me later. There's more to this message. So next time I speak, I'll speak on part two. So with that, we will close now. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Kind, loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for a beautiful message, for our rich history, and that we have a more sure word of prophecy, as Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 21, where we know that your word is of no private interpretation, that you have revealed all things in your word, and that you, it is your will that we should understand fully all of Scripture, that nothing has been hidden from us, that you have been you have made us the sacred repositories of precious truth and that we are to take it as a message to the end of the world. And Lord, we just ask and pray for your help to do this, that you will convict us of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness, and that time is short. Lord, we ask for your protection now as we go forward in this week, and we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.